let's look at a few of the features that have been introduced in the new version of Photoshop. I believe they're calling this version of Photoshop, it's still Photoshop CC for Creative Cloud, but this revision, they're just calling the 2014 version. So if you own Photoshop CC, uh, you should be able to get this version. It will be a separate install, so the old version of Photoshop should still remain on your machine. When you first launch the new version, it will ask if you want to migrate your settings. So it can go and grab all your presets and things and move them over for you. That would happen the first time you launch it. So here I'm in the new version. It's not going to look dramatically different necessarily, but there are a few things that I want to point out. A lot of the changes they made will be beyond what I would cover in a getting started with Photoshop class. So I'm going to try to concentrate on only those things that I really think apply. So let's take a look. First off, you remember whenever I wanted to change the color that I'd be using for painting or if I'm about to use the shape tool or uh, the text tool, usually I had to click on my foreground color. So on my screen, I come down to the lower, uh, lower left of my screen, click on my foreground color, and I would use this dialog box. I no longer have to use this. I didn't like having this always pop up and then you had to click OK to get out of it. Now in the new version, there is a color panel. I have it in the upper right of my screen. That's the default location when you first install Photoshop where you'll find it. I'll double click on the word color to expand it. If you don't find this panel on your screen, then you can go to the window menu. The window menu lists every one of these panels you can have visible. So if it's not visible on your screen, just go there and choose color to get it to be available. Now, just like when I was in the color picker, if you look at this panel, we have a vertical bar where I can choose basic colors like blue, red, green. And then in this general area, I can click and drag to choose a shade of that particular color. And so instead of having to constantly click on my foreground color, get this thing to show up and click OK, I just go to the upper right of my screen, choose the color that I'd like, and get to it very quickly. There are some additional options for this panel if you go to the side menu in the upper right. You have what's called a hue cube, and you also have what's called a brightness cube, which would change the order of how this is displayed, where now the brightness is in the vertical bar that's here, and the general colors are across uh, here, and how saturated they are are vertical. So you can switch between those two uh, here. Now, in case you're wondering, there's an icon on the left side, this one here. That's not new, necessarily. That was in the main color picker every time I used the color picker. It's just there was so much more in that color picker dialog box, you probably never noticed it. What that is, is this is showing you the nearest color to what you have chosen that would be reproducible on a printing press. So if you know you're going to go to a commercial printing press, you would need to click on that to make sure you shift the color to something that's reproducible. But that's not new. Watch, I'll go and click on my foreground color in this color picker, and I'll choose any color I want, and you'll see the same icon. It's sitting right here. You just never noticed it during class because there's so much more in this dialog box to distract you. So anyway, that is new. Then let's say you're going to paint. I'm just going to create a brand new document here anything to paint in, and I'll grab my paintbrush tool, I'll paint a little bit with whatever setting I currently have, and then I'm going to go up to the upper left of my screen where I have the preview for my brush, I'll click on it, and let's say I wanted to change the hardness setting, I work on a harder brush, and I paint within my image again, and then I switch and I work on a softer brush, and paint within my image again, then I work with possibly a larger brush, and I paint with my image again. Well, if I go back up to that same area I was in to change my settings, it's going to now list the last few brushes I've used up here. And I can click back to get back to different hardness levels I may have painted with or different sizes that I've painted with uh, to switch between them. But that area right there, where it's the most recently used brushes, is new. If for some reason you don't like it, it just confuses you, I believe you can turn it off by going to the side menu, this little gear icon, and there's a choice called Show Recent Brushes. If I turn that off, then it's going to look more like older versions of Photoshop would, or I can turn it back on. So that's another change that they've made. 
let's look at a few other things. Let's go and open one of the documents we work with during class. Take me just a moment to find it. You remember when we created this kind of postcard? Well, if you remember, there was something called Smart Guides. And Smart Guides made it so when I moved things around, if it ever snapped to anything, it tried to show me a guide as to why it was snapping at that particular time. Well, those Smart Guides have been updated quite a bit. Without even clicking on one of these layers to start to move it, as long as I'm in the Move tool, if I hold on the Command key and start moving my mouse around, it will start giving me measurements to show me how far the edges of the layer I'm working on are from the edges of this particular document. It tells me at the top I'm 0 0.27 um, inches from the top, I'm 5.520 inches from the left and all of that. And I can move my mouse around to various portions of my screen and it will give me an idea of how much space is there in between various objects within my document. I'm going to hide a bunch of the layers in this file. Let me just pick one of them to work with. We'll work with the one on the upper left. And I'll hide everything else to simplify this. I'm also going to hide my guides by typing Command H. And let's see what we can do. I'm going to use the Move tool. And I'm going to move this around. I'll hold the Option key, which we used before, to duplicate something. And I'll pull this over and move it over a certain bit. I'll do it again. And what you'll find is there's a new snapping feature you're going to get. It will usually snap now when these are evenly spaced, whereas before it had no idea when this space was the same as the space there. But now it will snap when things become evenly spaced, which is rather nice when you're trying to lay things out. Then there's one other feature I'd like to show you, and that is we can select things based on if they're in focus or not. So here's an image where if you look closely at it, you'll find the tree is in focus, this little monkey guy is in focus, and the background is very much out of focus. But what will happen is oftentimes I'll shoot an image where I on purpose change the aperture setting on my camera to give a very limited depth of field and then that area that's out of focus might be too bright or too colorful, and I want to tone it down. So here's a new way to select only that which is in focus or that is what is out of focus. I go to the Select menu. There's a new choice. It's called Focus Area. And if I choose that, I just need to wait a moment, and it'll be analyzing the picture. You'll see that right down here, this little whirly is telling me it's not done yet. Once that stops spinning, now it's going to give me a preview of my image. And in this case, it did actually a pretty darn good job of selecting what's in focus within the image, although it got rid of a little part of his tail. Well, there's actually a tool involved. Right up here, there's a plus tool and a minus tool. This will make more areas selected. This will make fewer areas. With the icon with the plus sign active, which is active by default, I'll grab a tiny little brush. I'll go to where the tail is missing. And I'm simply going to click. If you want to see where I am, I'm right about here with a really skinny brush so I wouldn't get overspray beyond the edge of the tail. I'll click and then I'll just wait. And it should reanalyze that part of the picture and add that area. I might need to move up here and click as well to get it to add more stuff. And I can finally get it to give me what I want. If there was an area of the blurry background that was showing up and it shouldn't, then I would instead grab the brush that's got the minus sign and I would paint on the area that should not have been selected. Now you can get different kinds of previews in here by clicking on this icon at the top. It'll give you the same general preview choices that you had when we were in the Refine Mask dialog box that we used during class. Uh, so if you don't want to see it with a white background, instead you'd like to see it with a colored overlay or something else to make it easier to evaluate, you're welcome to do that. And if you turn on the checkbox at the bottom called Soften Edge, it will spend more time analyzing the picture to try to more precisely match the edge quality. So if there was one area that was just had a slightly soft edge and another area with a crisp edge, that will do a better uh, job. When I click OK, in this case, I'm going to get a selection. 
And that selected all the areas that are in focus. Now I can go to the select menu and choose inverse to get the opposite. So that now I have that background area selected and I could do an adjustment layer. In this case, I'm gonna do a hue and saturation adjustment layer and I can bring down the saturation to make that area less colorful so it doesn't compete with what's in focus. I might also bring down the lightness just a little bit to make it a little bit darker and that should allow what's in focus to really jump out of the image. If I hide this adjustment by clicking on the eyeball icon, here's before, there's after. And you can see how I could easily do that because of the new feature that allows you to select only that which is in focus. Let's do it with one more image so that you can see what to do when it messes up. On this image, if I just go to the select menu and choose focus area, it's gonna have a little bit more trouble because if you look at the background, unlike the previous image that had a monkey in a tree and what was behind it was so blatantly out of focus, here the background, this surface slowly gets more and more out of focus and you can see also it had some issues. Well, when you first get into it, it automatically has this tool available with the plus sign on it. You don't even have to click on it. It will be there by default. And I can come into my image and now just paint over these areas where I see little holes in this giraffe. And when I let go, it will reevaluate those areas and hopefully fill them in. And it'll just take a few times of me painting like this. If you find it's difficult, because right there I couldn't tell if that's really the giraffe or not, uh, I can instead change my preview. In this case, I chose undo to undo that painting. At the top of my screen, I might go for my overlay, so I get a sense for really was that something that should have been kept or not. And in here, in between the legs, you can see areas that should be taken away and parts of the legs that have been hidden. Well, the areas of the legs that are hidden, I'm gonna paint across to have it work on them, see if it can bring them back. And for these areas that should be discarded, I can either go to the icon over here with the minus sign on it, or usually I can hold down the option key. Option usually takes away, and I can paint over this area to tell it to take it away. When I let go, it will reevaluate it, and I can paint across any area to have it change what kind of selection I'm getting there. Remember, the areas that are covered in red right now are the areas that will not be selected. So I need to get in here between the legs, tell it to get rid of those areas too. And usually I would zoom up and be a little bit more precise with what I'm doing here, but right now I'm just trying to give you a general overview. Whenever you like the end result, then just click OK and you'll get your selection. So with the 2014 update of Photoshop uh, CC, you can see that they've added some nice things for us. They've added additional features as well. They're just features that aren't quite appropriate for a getting started class with Photoshop. So to be sure to search on Google for the announcements for Photoshop CC 2014 update to see other things that they have changed. There is, for instance, new ways of blurring your picture. If you have a picture of a car and the wheels are at a slight angle, we can now do a motion blur on those wheels or we can do a blur based on a general shape and a bunch of other uh, changes. But I think what I showed you here are the things that are more aligned with what we taught in today's class.